Hey guys, I'm back. Um, I think I gave you a day off yesterday. I'm being very nice to you. Um, I've done a couple epics lately, and I'm trying to avoid doing another one. Um, that <laughs> doesn't mean much, right? <laughs> My short videos are longer than other people's long videos. So my long videos are longer than anything, except for major motion pictures. Uh, where do I start? You know, I'm, every, every time I do a video, uh, I'm digging, looking for things that I don't find. This is the case again today. But as I'm digging for the ones for my current video, of course I'm finding, I'm finding things from my past videos that I wish I had. I found a bunch of Don Cherry albums um, that I had when Don Cherry was playing with Ornette Coleman that I completely forgot I had, that I would have shown in my Don Cherry video. I found some Anthony Phillips vinyl that I think I showed the CDs, but it would have been nice to show the vinyl. And uh, some Terry Riley vinyl, several Terry Riley albums that I wish I had to show when I did my Terry Riley video. What does that have to do with today's video? Almost nothing, except that I'm sure tomorrow or the time I'm getting ready to do my next video, I'm going to find all the albums that I'm looking for by this guy. I, I still haven't figured out, I'm, I'm here filming and I haven't figured out exactly how I'm going to present this. Uh, doing one on Czechoslovakian bassist Miroslav Vitas, and I, it, it's, in some ways it's easier to go um, chronologically, but um, I think I'm going to go, I think I'm going to at least start at the, the beginning for me of where I discovered him. Now that's assuming I can find the album, of course. Which I can't right now. Uh, here we go. I found it. Miroslav Vitas, I first heard, nobody else did, but I did, here on this ECM album from 1978. Excuse me, June 1978 recorded. Terry Reptil, Miroslav Vitas, Jack Dijonet. Nice trio. Uh, Miroslav and Terry Reptil both play keyboards. And, uh, cor you know, and of course, their main instruments, uh, Terry Reptil on guitar, electric guitar. Miroslav an upright bass, no electric bass, thankfully. And Jack just on drums on this one. Uh, this was one of the early, early ECMs. I, um,. Did a video on how I got into this stuff, and Bar Phillips was the first artist, not only of ECM but of this type of music that I ever bought. And based on the people that appeared on um, the Bar Phillips album, I started buying albums that featured those musicians. Well, the very first ECM Bar Phillips this type of music album I ever bought was Bar Phillips Three Day Moon, and Terry Reptil played guitar on that. Coming from a rock and progressive rock thing, that was a really good place to start. You know, Terry's got the very um, processed guitar sound, which appealed to me. Good way to, to work your way into other music. Um, and I liked what I heard, so I started looking for more albums, and one of the first things I picked up, uh, looking for a Terry Reptile album, not knowing which one to get, decided to go with a format that at least I could wrap my head around. And that's essentially a trio, a bass guitar and drum trio. Uh, regular drum kit this time, the Bar Phillips albums had like hand percussion on there, uh, so this was even more kind of a normal progression. Not progression so much as a, a normal band, more of what I was used to hearing. You know, electric guitar, regular drum kit. In this case, an upright bass in place of the electric, and keyboards handled um, through overdubs by um, Miroslav Vitas and Terry Reptil. Still blew me away this album. Love this album to this day. To this day, it's one of those special... This is an Icon album, and I was going to do an Icon uh, separate video on it. But to be honest, um, I've this is the second time I'm talking about it already. And I knew, well, if I do a Miroslav Vitas thing, uh, I'm going to end up showing this album. And I don't have a lot to say about it that I haven't already said. I'm totally blown away when I heard this album. And it was the first time I heard both Jack Dijonette and Miroslav Vitas, and only the second time I heard Terry Reptil. Um, so there was a, you know, a lot of firsts and things coming at me. And the, the one thing that really struck me about this, and I mentioned this once before, and I hope you were paying attention, because there is a test afterwards. Um, 
I didn't get the drumming. Not that I thought it was bad. I'm like, how come this guy's not playing like a heavy syncopated beat? Well, on this album, as well as a lot of others that he did at this time period, Jack DeJunette was playing in a John Christensen style. And that is, um, I kind of look at it like an orchestral style, even though it's a small group jazz band and he's playing a standard drum kit. And there is rhythms going on. Um, a lot of the rhythm is being played on the cymbals, but that's not even the thing that makes it unique because that's a pretty standard thing for jazz. But the drum kit is there to, to, to more build dynamics and tension. And I always think of it as, you know, the John Christensen style, um, as being almost like what the timpani would be like in an orchestra. Where the timpani often doesn't play a beat, but it's there, it's there to change the volume levels and to build tension in the music and change dynamics from soft to louder or slightly ominous and things like that. And it's like taking this 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 mindset of the timpani in the, in the, in the context of an orchestra and bringing it to a regular drum kit. Now, if you describe that to somebody who never heard it, I don't think they would know what to play. And Jack DeJunette did acknowledge that he is familiar with John Christensen's style, and in fact, at this period when, when Jack DeJunette was doing a lot of sessions for ECM Records, he was doing a lot of sessions with the same guys that John Christensen was playing with or had played with previously. So I think, I think Jack was aware of John's style, and especially with John Christian playing so much with Terry Reptile, I think Jack kind of went on the assumption that maybe this is what Terry wants or you know, this is the way I should approach this music. And he was right. To be honest, if he had played in a kind of heavy beat, uh, syncopated, um, standard groove oriented style or rock style, not only would it sound dated, because this is 1978, so I can imagine the grooves they would get into, uh, but I wouldn't probably be listening to it today. Um, the fact that the drums are as open-ended as they are um, make them as much a contributor to the music as the guitar and the keyboards and the bass, because it's not just playing this predictable thing. Yeah, there's the beat. Okay, let me listen to hear somebody's doing an interesting solo or something. Um, and I didn't get the style at first, and I wondered why he wasn't playing more of a beat. Um, as time went on and I bought more ECM albums, of course, I, I got it. Uh, and, and it's my favorite style of drumming, actually. Um, now it is. But it's, it's, it's tough when people first hear it, especially in a small band context. Um, but this was the first place I heard uh, Miroslav Vitas. This is uh, maybe a little bit more of a Terry J. Riptal album. Hard to say. Um, Riptal gets the six tracks on here. Riptal gets two tracks credited solely to him. Miroslav Vitas gets two tracks uh, credit for composition. Maybe it's more equal, equal, you know, and then and then the two other tracks are essentially uh, improvisations credited to all three guys. So Jack DeJunette's the only guy that doesn't really get a solo writing credit. Uh, there's a, there's a track, and there's not a bad track on here. I mean, it, it, it's a very cohesive whole as an album. And it's extremely likable. Um, that, wow, that's a dumb statement. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. Extremely likable. Yeah. I'm trying to do two things at once here sometimes. It doesn't work. Um, oops. Sorry, folks. Hold on a second. I think my brain is attached to my head by these screws, or else that would come out, too. Um, so this is, a great, this is a great album. And my introduction to Miroslav Vitas and Jack DeJunette both. And, you know, things just kept on outgrowing from there. I wanted to get to get more and to find more. Um, there wasn't a lot. There was only one other album that they made years later uh, from these three guys. So I started buying albums by all three of those folks, but they were very different than, than this one together. And the recording quality is incredible. I'm not sure that I've really heard drums recorded this well and in this way. There's a clarity there. Um, ECM's famous for that, but because this was such an uh, early purchase in my history of ECM, now I just I just expect that their records have that clarity and that sound. I never quite heard the drums as as clear. It's not the kind of thing like in rock where the snare drum is ten times louder than all the other drums, or the bass drum is extremely loud um, type of type of thing because that's the 
more pop music, pop rock music, dance music, whatever, way of projecting a drum kit. This was even, you heard the toms. You, not only did you hear the toms, but you heard the uh, the tonal qualities of the toms, and very clearly, not kind of messy uh, or muddy. And the cymbals, you know, the, the lightest tap of the cymbals, um, with with the wooden sticks really comes through, and that's that's really a, a signpost of the ECM engineers and the sound quality of their albums. But that all led into the whole of what I think makes this album so great. Very cohesive. There's six pieces on there, but it's almost like a concept album. It's like they're all together, and and it, it's almost like a six movements um, of one big long piece. Really great. My introduction to to Miroslav. Now, I don't know, I'm not 100% sure where I went after that, but I know it wasn't that much later that I came across this earlier album that was recorded in uh, one track, I showed this before too, uh, one track in December 76, the rest in July 77. Not on ECM. This is on, well, here it's on Freedom, the Freedom, Arista Freedom Jazz Label. But that's who put it out in America. I think this basically came from a uh, European company, and Arista Freedom maybe just who, uh, at the time, distributed it in the U.S. This is, an, this is one of these albums. I was going to do a whole, al a whole video on albums that I love that everyone hates. This is the lead one. This would be the, 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 the main one that I think of. Um, if you look up the, if you look up the um, reviews on Amazon, which is... Most of them have been wiped out over history because there's been a number of issues of of this album, and um, over the years you you had multiple entries for the same album. You know, maybe six different entries for Miroslav Vitas Miroslav album. Five of them are out of print. So what happens is you have different reviews under each one of those um, listings for the album. And it looks like, I think the last time I looked, there was only one listing for this album, which is also out of print now anyway. Uh, but when they removed the other five editions of this album that had gone out of print previously, it appears that they also deleted a lot of the reviews for it. But of the ones that I saw, there's maybe three or four reviews on there, which there definitely used to be many, many, many more. <laughs> one of the reviews simply is titled, Garbage. Not true. Um, but one of the things that appealed to me on this album, and I have a love, and I've talked about it before, of solo albums, or the less musicians, the better. That's my way of thinking in a lot of cases. I love nothing more than an album where a musician goes in and plays all the parts himself and overdubs. You know, in, the, in this case, Miroslav is playing, uh, he's playing the upright bass, and although he does play electric bass, he doesn't play it on this album. Uh, and also uh, acoustic piano, electric piano, uh, multiple synthesizers, mini moogs, arps, string synthesizer, that kind of thing. And he does a lot of those here. So he's almost a one-man band. The only other person or people helping out are a couple hand percussionists. Um, Don Elias, the late Don Elias, plays um, congos, bongos, hand drums, and kit drums on all but one track. And there's another hand percussionist. Um, Armin Halburian, who plays percussion on the one track that was recorded in December 76, with the rest of them being recorded in July 77 with Don Elias. So it's just percussion, just a percussionist, and then Miroslav playing everything else. I love that idea. I love that, that whole concept, and that's probably what made me pick this up over other albums by him, which I've, I've bought since on um, CD. Uh, so it was recorded 76 and 77. Why do people hate it? Uh, it does tend to meander at times. Um, there's times when there's uh, just a rhythmic groove going like on the congas or something like that. And the keyboards are just kind of... Uh, Miroslav is playing... Mainly, there's keyboards in every track. Um, and Miroslav is sometimes maybe aimlessly improvising on keyboards. But... That's jazz, you know what I mean? Sometimes sometimes songs go on for 30 minutes, you know, with jazz, and, and there might be a six-minute thing where there's nothing happening here. Now, there's no really, really long songs on here. The longest one is eight minutes. Um, but, yeah, I can see there's a couple times when it meanders. It doesn't really seem to be going anywhere. Um, but it's, it's far from garbage, and, and one of the reasons that I think people don't like it is it's not very well recorded. Um, the keyboards sound okay. Uh, the upright bass sounds okay. 
Um, but a lot of the percussion is there's a couple times when there's a full drum kit. Um, it sounds it sounds all right. It's a little lacking in clarity, almost like they were playing in. Uh, too big of a room with too much reverberation so you don't get the clarity of a lot of the drums it kind of starts feeding back and getting a bit muddy um, but there's also uh, several moments and it's no fault of anybody, anyone's playing um, there's, there's a few moments that uh, Don Elias is playing um, maybe bongos or some type of wooden hand percussion instrument that are just so poorly recorded it almost sounds like he's banging on cardboard boxes um, and I think that hurts, because I think some people do make the mistake of hearing something that's poorly recorded and think that it's poor music or poorly played. And in other times, you'll hear something that a two-year-old could play, but because it's recorded you know, with fantastic sonic quality, they think, oh, gee, that's really great. So I think there's, and I can understand that. You know, if there's an audio mess going on, sometimes it's really hard to pick out what's being played versus the sound of what's being played. Um, there's also an oddity in here because the uh, it sounds like there's a there's a mini moog section or, or in one of the one of the songs um, where there's acoustic piano playing and mini moog on top of that and it sounds like the mini moog and the acoustic piano are not necessarily in tune. It sounds like the tuning is slightly off. I don't hear that with the electric piano and the other synthesizers. I don't hear it with the string ensemble synthesizer, but I do catch it a little bit with the mini moog. It sounds like the mini moog is too sharp or opposite, actually. Probably the acoustic piano was not necessarily uh, tuned properly. It might have been tuned to itself okay, but um, overall wasn't correctly tuned. And then you get that that contrast, so it doesn't help. Yeah, does it does it meander? Yeah, a little bit. But there's some fantastic. I would not give this album up for anything. And now that I've mentioned that and shown this, I probably won't do my video of albums I love that everyone else hates. Um, and I think, I'm, I'm waiting to hear what Carm thinks of this. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about that. However, what I found out, well, still going out of, out of order a little bit. Um, yeah, I'm prepared. <laughs> It was many years later, uh, and I got Miroslav and a bunch of other things, um, that I knew who Weather Report was. By the time I discovered who Weather Report was, I really wasn't interested in Fusion anymore at that point. But nonetheless, I did start picking up some of their albums. The band was still in existence at this time, because I'm talking about the very late 70s. Um, and at that time, Jocko Pistorius was the bass player for the band, and I didn't know much of the band's history. I knew Wayne Shorter and Joe Zabinul in the band. I didn't know the history of it. I never knew that Miroslav Vitas was a founding member of Weather Report. I didn't know that until, wow, I don't know how many Miroslav Vitas albums I had, just because I had missed those early Weather Report albums. And, um, you know, I would pick up a Weather Report thing here and there. Wasn't a huge fan, um, but I still bought them. And then, simply because I had read that, uh, well, you know what, I'm going to do this in order because it's going to get too confusing. This isn't the order I bought the Weather Report albums in. Miroslav Vitas was, nonetheless, one of the three founding members of Weather Report, along with um, Joe Zawinul and Wayne Shorter. In the beginning years, and I'm talking about their first five, six, seven albums. Their drum chair changed every, not only every album, but you know they would record an album with one drummer and probably he would leave halfway through the recording of that album if he made it through the whole album at all. They would have maybe another drummer on the album playing one or two tracks. They would go out playing live to support the album a few months after the album came out maybe. They'd have another drummer live. By the time they went into the studio to do the new album, they'd have a different drummer than the live drummer they had. So they never their percussion chair was never held down. So there's no real original member in the drum chair, really. It's constantly changing in those early years. Um, and also it did change throughout the years. They you know they did have a few albums where they had Pete Erskine and Omar Hakim um, but those guys still only lasted a, like, you know, what, two or three years. Um, yeah, drum chair was not, maybe it was slightly more stable the last few years of the band, but the early years, forget it. So it was really Wayne Shorter, Miroslav Vitas, and Joe Zawinul, which I didn't know. 
Let me say, oh, by the way, as far as his history, uh, Miroslav v Vitus is um, from Prague, and he was formally trained in, in Prague, um, and one of his early bands that he that he played in, he actually started playing keyboards before he started playing bass. One of his early bands that he played in was actually with Jan Hammer, the keyboard player. Way well, this is before they came to America. Um, but apparently Miroslav won a scholarship to the Berkeley College of Music because he started playing piano and up and upright bass very young. And I guess him coming to America was really, in a lot of ways. Not the start of his playing career, but certainly more than likely his uh, being very visible and his doing a lot of recording. Uh, he actually, um, 67, according to the histories I've read, uh, Miles Davis uh, saw uh, Miroslav Vitas playing in Clark Terry's band, Trumpeter Clark Terry's band, and um, invited Miroslav to come and play with um, a gig that um, Miles had going on in New York at the time. Now, uh, Miroslav, I don't know if any recordings ever came out of that. He did not stay with Miles very long. It was a fairly short thing. I'm, you know, I'm a little surprised because it seems like everything that Miles ever did was recorded and released, so eventually I'm expecting something to be seen. Uh, with him, but I, with uh, Miroslav Vitas playing with Miles, and this was '67. This was right, kind of on the cusp of Miles just changing his music and going the electric route, and that would be when Wayne Shorter was in the band. Um, so anyway, and it, that could be. I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure. I'm assuming that that's where also Miroslav Vitas may have met Wayne Shorter. I know Joe Zawinul was in uh, Miles' band in '68. I'm not sure if he was in in '67, but. Um, Wayne Shorter had been there for, for some time already. So I'm guessing that may be where the connection uh, to eventually form Weather Report a few years down the road may have come through Miroslav Vitas meeting Wayne Shorter. And eventually, you know, as those guys do, they left Miles' band. And um, in the meantime, um, Joe Zawinul had come into Miles' band, met Wayne Shorter, formed essentially a partnership. When they left Miles, they decided to go off and explore the fusion world on their own. And uh, may have been, um, you know, I'm guessing Wayne Shorter that said, hey, I got an idea for a bass player. But uh, Miroslav Vitas was very much a third of that, of that core uh, of original members. And I didn't get this one until much later on. This is a very first no title Weather Report album. Guys, I can't find my vinyl on some of this stuff, so... Uh, I, I only have the CDs to show in a lot of cases. Um, but this, and actually I have them all. Uh, I have all of the Weather Report albums. Um, this is the best one. For me, you know, I, you could have bought the first two or three, four maybe, uh, f five tops, and that's all you would really need. Um, boy, this is a real pretty album. Real pre-synthesizer, pre but there's... Um, attempting to get electronic effects through other means, and I guess organ and um, piano and things like that. They did some weird recording techniques to get some otherworldly sounds. And um, But beautiful, beautiful writing, a nice album, not the fusion-y stuff that they came to be known for, their prettiest album by far. Um, really nice, really nice. And I was surprised when I got this, because this is one of the last one of the last Weather Report albums I, I got. Um, and Miroslav is playing pretty much upright, I think exclusively upright. Their second album that they recorded was one that was only uh, released in Japan initially. And it's a live album. And and um, it was a two-disc set. It runs somewhere between 90 and 95 minutes. What is it called? Live in Tokyo? Um, I kind of bought this for completion's sake, and again, it's it's the drum chair changed from the first album, but it's the same you know band, uh, you know Joe Zawinul, Wayne Shorter, Miroslav and Upright. This is a headache, boy. This this album. Sorry guys, if you like this, I don't know how you can listen to this thing through. I've done it a couple times. Um, it's probably easier for me to listen to Metallica than it is to this. Yeah, you know, the the problem is, well, the, you know, this is what seventy one or something like somewhere seventy one, seventy two, probably recorded in seventy one. Um, what's the problem with it? Well, live albums back then weren't recorded necessarily that well. Uh, but the real problem 
with this is um, there's a lot of jamming, a lot of improv on there. It's almost unlike the first album. There's no, there's really no pretty stuff on here, to, to be honest with you. It's more of a jammy kind of thing. Um, that's not bad in itself. The problem is this is still pre-synthesizer, and Joe Zawadil's mainly playing electric piano. He's mainly playing electric piano, though. Unfortunately... Um, playing through at times a fuzz box like a guitar so it makes a horrible distorted sound I'm trying to remember now if he plays with a wah wah pedal too or not on this particular live album this is really a tough gut to sit and listen to this whole thing and even worse well I don't know even worse for me just as equally bad Mirsal Vitas is playing upright bass through a wah wah pedal you know and that's you know tr I wouldn't say they were trying to sound hip they were just exploring I guess current technology at the time but it doesn't work. It ruins the nuances of the upright bass completely. And on the piano side, the, the beauty of the electric piano as well, because it's fed through this distortion, it sounds awful. And it's really, it's really a headache. Um, they didn't release it in the U.S. either. When it came time for their second album in the U.S., what they did, they took about 22 minutes of that live album, of that like 90 or 95 minute live album. And they just excerpted the live album, essentially, for the second side of their second American album, second studio album, essentially, I Sing the Body Electric. Um, so you get to hear uh, about 22 minutes from that live set on there. And honestly, that's enough. I can barely get through that. Um, what's on here that's really nice, that makes it, for me, really um, probably their number two album, is the studio stuff on the first side. It's really pretty. It kind of, it's not as good as the first album, but it picks up on that vibe. And there's there's a few guests on here, too, playing, I think, like French horns and things like that. Um, one of the things on one track is, which really surprised me, because I don't know how he met them, uh, is Ralph Towner, one of my favorite guitarists in the whole world, actually plays on one track on here. Uh, a Wayne Shorter track called The Moors and it's really nice it's really a, a, a pretty beautiful expressive track and uh, the studio side has some um, guests on here it's got Hubert Laws on flute uh, Andrew White on English horn another guy playing uh, piccolo trumpets um, there's some there's some voices some wordless vocals nice Nice album. Uh, I wish the whole thing had been done in the studio because the first side is really some amazing writing and not stuff they could reproduce live because because of the horn sections and the, the guests and just the way uh, really, really nice, pretty stuff. But that second, you know, what was originally the second side is an excerpt of that horrible live album. Um, and um, they were still going strong at that point. On this point, and there's a sticker on here, so I'm going to take the booklet out. Um, come time for the third album, a little bit of a change. Sweet Nighter, which I can't find my vinyl for this. Oh, why didn't I show my... Uh, I got my vinyl of I Sing the Body Electric sitting here. Why didn't I show it? It took me two hours to dig it out. I'm going to show it just because I dug it out. I know that's that's hardly an excuse. But you know... I spent hours looking for this crap today. Um, <laughs> okay, so there's, there's I sing the body of like, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm losing people probably as I speak. <laughs> I'm just showing that because I have it. I also have this on vinyl, but this one I know I don't have back there because this is the one I was looking for, Sweet Nighter, their third album, which somebody just showed this on, was it Robin Boston? Who showed this? Somebody just, just got this on vinyl. Uh, Rob. I think it was Rob because Rob had his huge hole of like 175 vinyls or something like this, and this is one of them. This is one of their better, you know, better albums. I think their first five albums are all worth listening to, not not counting the live one. Um, you'll hear that on the second album. The, that 22-minute excerpt of the live album is more than you need to hear. Um but Sweet Nighter, the third album, still really, 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 really good um, for you know for that for this band. Excuse me, but they're already uh, there's there's a noticeable shift away from the dreamier, quieter um, pieces, more impressionistic pieces, toward um, a slight. What do you want to call it? Um, Slightly, slightly more, 
solid rhythm rather than jazz. Almost like, uh, and it was, Joe Zawinul was essentially pushing at this point, wanting um, a more pop, R&B, funk, solid rhythm section, which was hard with an upright bass. Now, on this one, Miroslav also does play electric. But oddly enough, Joe Zawinu is bringing in um, Andrew White, who is a, uh, a studio musician who played with various people and also played French horn, oddly enough, on the previous album. Um, he was one of the guys that played French horn, I believe, on I Sing the Body Electric. They got Andrew White playing electric bass on some tracks where Miroslav Venus is also credited with playing electric bass. Um, so that's, that's a little weird. And um, so there's there's a couple tracks here that have, uh, well, actually, all of a sudden, Miroslav Vita's playing a lot of electric bass. And he's still playing some acoustic bass, but almost all those tracks are playing acoustic bass. Andrew Wright's also playing electric bass. Now, I don't know if Andrew Wright was invited to join the band in replacement of Miroslav, and he turned it down because I think he had a fairly lucrative career. I think he was a musical director for some more pop bands. Um, and probably had a nice studio uh, career going, didn't have to travel, didn't have to join a band and necessarily take orders from people. The thing that, the one thing that really st struck me about this album, which I didn't realize looking at the titles don't really mean that much, but there's a track called Will on here, which I recognized right away. I'm like, wait, where do I know that? Well, there was a track called Will on the Miroslav Vitas, the very first album I got by him, Jack DeJanet, Terje Reptil. One of my favorite tracks was the track written by Miroslav Vitas called Will. I never knew he had recorded it before. I thought he wrote it for that 1978 album with Terje Reptil and Jack DeJanet. Well, it turns out that no, it was actually recorded here first on this, I want to say I think this is 73, 1973 album, Sweet Nighter. And uh, it's nice, to, it's interesting to compare the versions because, you know, they're both studio versions. Um, obviously different because you've got uh, Joe, Joe Zavinell's keyboards on there, you know, versus uh, the keyboard part being actually played on the Terje Ripple album by Miroslav Vitas. And, of course, you've got uh, Wayne Shorter on, on sax here where you've got no sax on the other album. You've got guitar. But oddly enough, I actually prefer the... Um, the Terje Reptile version of it um, better. It's it's a little uh, more mysterious, kind of, you know? It, it's got a nice vibe to it and seems like it could go in a lot of different directions. I think the writing was on the wall already because it seemed like it was Joe Zawinul that brought in Andrew White to play a lot of electric bass on that album, even though Miroslav Vitas was not only willing to play electric bass, but did play electric bass on that album. And all of a sudden, by the time the next album comes, ah, yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm taking the CD booklets out, and I spent two hours digging these files out. <laughs> okay, here's the fourth Weather Report album, Mysterious Traveler. A lot of people really list this as their favorite Weather Report album. Not me, but it's good. I can see why people like it. Um, but it does get repetitive. On this on this album, Miroslav Vitas plays on one track, and there's about three tracks that I really love on that album, um, but they're all the shorter tracks. And in fact, the one track that Miroslav does play on, called American Tango, and it took me years to find out because even though they credit him as a musician on here, they don't say who plays on what track. And Alfonso Johnson is the new bass player, strictly playing electric. You could hear that, yeah, he's playing kind of the bass like that Andrew White was playing on, on the Sweet Nighter album, that, that more R&B, um, groove-oriented electric bass sound. But honestly, it's nothing that Miroslav couldn't play but the problem is it's so repetitive. There's like an eight and a half minute track that has the same bass riff running throughout it. And people love it. It's And it's very famous track, very well known on here. But um, it, it gives me a headache, you know, because I, I just keep on focusing on the bass. And the bass is just playing the same riff over and over and over again for almost the entire eight minute, 42 second duration of the song or however long it is. Um and it's just it's just too much. What you're supposed to be listening to, I guess, is the soloing over that bass riff. But um, and it's no fault of Alfonso Johnson. Um, I I don't think Miroslav Vitas would have played something that repetitive, to be honest with you. And if that's what Zawinul wanted, that's what he got. Um, 
because I've heard Alfonso Johnson, you know, playing in, in many years since, and and uh, you know as an electric bassist, and that's uh, he might be a bit more in the R and B style, but you know he's a good bassist, and 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 you know he doesn't. My impression was that it's not necessarily his idea to 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 play the same few notes for eight and a half minutes necessarily in every song. I mean, I hear him playing a lot more than that, you know, in terms of doing something creative. But I, it was the direction. And I, even according to what Miroslav Vita said, that, you know, Joe Zavano wanted to very much go in a commercial, funky direction. The one track, uh, there, there are nonetheless, the, the three longest tracks tend to get into kind of like a repetitive groove. Um, there's some nice soloing in them, but um, not my cup of tea, really. You know, and There was a time I really liked it for, for a brief period of time. Now when I hear it, it's like I don't quite get why I liked it. But the other three or four songs, the shorter tunes, are actually really nice. There's a little bit of a world music flavor there, a little more of an acoustic sound, even with the electric bass in there, um, that are really nice. But the one track that I like the most is really, oddly enough, the one that Miroslav plays on. And I didn't know it was had sound for 20, 25 years before um, I could go on the internet and find out what were the tracks that Miroslav played on versus the ones he didn't, because nothing inside the album or the CD tells you. Um, eventually, somebody posted something up where they, they mentioned that the only track that Miroslav Vitas plays on is the one where he got a co-writing credit, actually. So it makes sense. Um, Cold American Tango, but it's three minutes and 42 seconds, but it's one of my favorite pieces on the album. I think that may have obviously been one of the first things that were recorded um, before all the other material, and basically, uh, you know, from that point on, Joe kind of pushed Miroslav out and he was out of the band. Which is unfortunate, but, you know, I, the band was not going in a direction that I liked in particular, and I can see that Miroslav didn't care for it necessarily as much, and if he was going to remain in the band, um, he was going to be playing funk riffs on electric bass, and that really is not where his strength is. So, kind of going out of order, but going to Miroslav's um, own solo career as a leader, we have a record called Mountain in the Clouds. Now, this is... Um, this is a reissue with two with with two albums on here. Uh, so you can ignore the Chick Corea album that's on here. It's it's a, a a double issue. One of these things that they stupidly stuck two albums together on one disc and didn't really think it out very well because I don't think any of the any of the musicians. I'm not sure. I'm not. I don't. I don't think. Um, Drummer Joe Chambers happens to play on both albums, but that's the only connection between these two albums, an early Chick Corea album, and one of, if not his first solo album by Miroslav Vitas called Mountain in the Clouds. Really good album. But when, when these bozos put this, this t compilation together, um, not that jazz fans couldn't appreciate both albums, but apart from Joe Chambers being essentially a session musician on the two albums, they have nothing in common. And I know the Miroslav Vitas album is from 72, but I, I, you know, I don't know exactly when it was recorded. So it was either recorded in 71 or 72. Um, but when they put it together, they didn't really look at the time considerations because they had to leave a track off the Miroslav Vitas album to fit these two onto one CD. And since there's no real correlation between the two albums except for the presence of Joe Chambers, and Joe Chambers doesn't even play on the whole um, Miroslav Vitas album. He just appears on a couple tracks. They should have chosen another album to, to pair it up with that they could fit the entire album. So they left one track off, but initially this was the only place where you could get a CD reissue of that album. Uh, I think it came out, I, I think you can actually buy the original Mountain in the Clouds on CD now with all the original tracks missing. They left off one, one track. It has, wait, one, two, three, four, five, six. There's six tracks on here from the original album. And they left off uh, um, When Face Gets Pale, which is the name of a track that they left off just for time considerations. Oddly enough, the same album was reissued a few years later under a different title called Infinite Search. And this is what the, the vinyl looked like. And so it had that track restored when Face Gets Pale was on here. But there was an oddity in that 
when they reissued this on vinyl and they changed the, the title, supposedly there's a slightly different sound mix, but I have to be honest, I don't hear it um, from, from listening to it. I haven't, listened, I haven't listened to them together for a while, but at the time I listened very closely and I couldn't detect um, the difference really. The weird thing is, they left when they reissued it, they left one track off from the original album and they included another track um, in its place. And they were both short tracks. So what do they have in common? They both do have a version of Freedom Jazz Dance, a version of uh, a song Mountain in the Clouds, which is the title track of the album. They both had When Face Gets Pale. It just happened to be left off the original, the CD edition of it, but it was on the original Mountain on the Clouds album. And a track called uh, Infinite Search, which they both had, both had, and there's a track I will tell him on you, which they both had, and this this version called um, Infinite Search had a track called Epilogue that was added onto it, and another track, which I could never pronounce, it looks like it's Sereka or Kareka, which was on this one, which was two minutes and forty one seconds, which was taken off of. Um, f off this version of the album. Um, why do I mention this? Because when they issue this on CD, and it's the same damn crappy company, they could have included a complete version of this. So it could have been Mountain in the Clouds, Infinite Search. All they had to do was add the 2 minute and 41 second track that was on originally on Mountain in the Clouds that was taken off of the Infinite Search reissue of the same album. Now in the vinyl age I could see because it was going over 40 something minutes. There's no reason in the CD era that you couldn't have taken that 2 minute and 41 second track that was left off of, of the Mountain in the Clouds that was left off of this when they reissued this under the different title. So what did I do? I mean it's very frustrating because if you really want to get the full session, the full album, um, you have to buy two of these. You, you have to buy, you know, you have to buy this one to get the track epilogue that was on the only on Infinite Search, and you have to buy this one to get that Kareka or Sereka track, which is two minutes and forty one seconds, because they left that off this reissue, but they should have put it on here because it's still only forty something minutes and they had another thirty five minutes of empty space. But they didn't do it, so you gotta buy two of these. Two, two, two of these. So you line their pockets. Um so what did I do is I burned, you know, I burned my own CD and I put all the tracks on one place and that's what I play. Um, that's the way I roll, okay? What does that tell you about the music? Nothing. But that was, oh, it's a good album, by the way. <laughs> Should I fail to mention that? Who plays on here? Miroslav Vitas, John McLaughlin, Herbie Hancock, Jack DeJanette, and Joe Chambers plays on only one track. Um, but that's you know that's the thing. I almost forget sometimes. I'm so I'm so upset when I see the way that they jerk this around and just try to get more money out of you. Um, so it's quite a hell of a, it's a hell of a band. And like I said, I think it was recorded seventy seventy. It's hard to say seventy seventy one. I th I think you know. It's probably 1970. It's very early. You can tell by John McLaughlin's sound. Very clean guitar sound. Uh, if you have things like um, Where Fortune Smiles and albums like that, that McLaughlin led pre-Mahavishnu, his guitar sound was pretty clean. But it's a hell of a band. It's not badly recorded. It's not a fantastic sounding thing. I mean, this is obviously the better issue to go with. You're only really missing the 2 minute and 41 second track. Nowadays, not when I bought this, but nowadays you could probably buy the download of that one track, the Kareka track that's on the original Mountain in the Clouds. You could compile your own album from it. Um, now, Miroslav was apparently, understandably, probably not too thrilled that he was kind of essentially pushed out of Weather Report. So in 76, this, this has to be my reasoning for him making this, this album. Because I'm, I'm telling you the good, the bad, and the ugly, and this is as bad as it gets. Um, in 76, he records this album called The Magical Shepherd. Now, interestingly enough, 
right after this, he did that Miroslav album, which is, comp whether you like it or not, the music is completely different. Sounds like two completely different people. Now, there's no recording date on this, but the issue date was 1976. I want to say that it was either recorded in 76 or 75, not long after Miroslav left Weather Report. If you see the musicians on here, it sounds impressive again, but then you hear the music and it doesn't sound impressive. Uh... Man, they write, i got to turn the lights up because they write so damn small on here. Don't they know that the only people interested in this music are people who can't see anymore? Um, Herbie Hancock, playing no acoustic piano, oddly enough. Jack DeJunet, Aerdo Moreira, James Gadson, who I don't know, and the bad sign, two vocalists, two female vocalists. They're not bad as vocalists, but, but it's, it's, it's bad. Um... What is this? So Joe gets thrown out a weather report, and it's almost like he's like, I'll show Joe Zawinul that I can play funky. And, and he makes this, it was recorded in California, but it sounds like New York, and there's even a track called New York City on here. I think, yeah, New York City. It's a bad funk album. It sounds like, you know, it could be any R&B, American funk band from the mid-70s, the kind of stuff that sounds really dated in the worst way today. There's a lot of electric on there. There's nothing magical about it at all. It sounds like he stumbled into a New York disco and started playing along, and within a few seconds of the first track starting, the female vocalists are there singing about their whatevers, you know? There's vocals and lyrics, and oh my God, it's horrible. Um, and what people said about that Miroslav album... Maybe they were listening to this one and got the two confused. I don't know. Thankfully, less than a year after this came out, Miroslav went and recorded that earlier Miroslav album that I showed you, that although people don't like it, um, musically it's not at all in the same place. That is uh, instrumental and a little bit more impressionistic and more jazz-like, and even if you don't like it because it um, meanders or whatever, um, it's still not this. This is just a funk album. It's horrible. It doesn't... I think if you gave me a hundred years to guess in a blindfold test, I would never guess this was any musician that I'd liked or know. Um, a lot of electric bass, a lot of funk grooves. Um, it's almost like a party album. It, it, it's, it doesn't fit in with anything here that he does. Thankfully, he didn't say. But it's almost like, see, Joe, Joe, I can play funk. You know, it's almost like that. Um, but thankfully, later that year, he started doing this one, and even though people don't like it, I do. I, I love it very much. And he, he kind of made up a little bit for it. Um, then in 1978, I want to say, he recorded another album that's kind of fusion-y, that's not, it's not great, but after hearing The Magical Shepherd, this is almost like a pure acoustic jazz album, you know? Um, this is another weird one. It's, it's like, um, Miroslav didn't seem like it's credit to him, but you know what? It, it seems like it's more of a co-led thing, and without a real defined direction. i got to turn the light up again, man. Um, it's got some good names now. Miroslav does play some electric on here, but it's not the annoying funk stuff. Um, he plays acoustic bass, and he plays synthesizers on this album, which is unusual in a group setting. Uh, John Schofield plays guitar, and this is early in John's career, 78. Kenny Kirkland, the late, great, really, died very young. Kenny Kirkland plays piano and electric keyboards. I don't think there's too many examples of Kenny Kirkland playing electric keyboards. He was a nice pianist. Um, Mabu Yamaguchi on soprano sax and George Ashtuk on drums. Ashtuk. I know, I know he's Japanese because I know there's two Japanese musicians involved here. And um, I think this is already... Uh, recorded in for a Japanese label initially and did come out here. Recorded in November '78. A um, little bit more of a fusion thing. Interesting. It's it's almost schizophrenic. It's it's got a nice recorded sound, um, but there's it's interesting because there's six tracks. Only two are written by uh, Miroslav Vitas, but they're my two favorite tracks. They're really nice. Whereas tracks are pretty good. Um, there's Two tracks by Kenny Kirkland, who are which are really fantastic tracks, really good. And there's two by Schofield, which are not that great. Um, they're they're fusiony stuff, 
which was odd because I didn't really think that John Schofield didn't really get into the fusion stuff quite quite at this period yet. He seemed to do more fusiony albums uh, only after he joined Miles Davis, which was after later after this, when he got fusioning for a little while and kind of backed out of that and went back to a um, I'll say slightly cleaner sound. He always used uh, maybe like a hint of distortion in his electric sound, but it was pretty clean guitar sound. But his two tracks on here are not are, are the weak spot on the album. The two Kenny Kirk Kirkland tracks are good, but it almost seems like it doesn't know where it wants to go. It's, it's a little too slick sounding. Um, it's not bad, but it's more of a, uh, a gap filler. You know, I wouldn't run out and get that. Um, but that was 76, which was not long before uh, this one came out in 78, which was just fantastic, which I showed you, but I have to show it again because I love it so much. What else do we have? 79. I don't know. I don't think I'm skipping around. I could be. Um, but I'm trying not to. May 79. Uh, I'm sure there's things I missed. Um, and I know Miroslav does play backup for other people. I have a couple examples of those, too. May 79, Miroslav, uh, after that, that one album with Jack Dijon and Terry Ripple, lands where he belongs, and that's ECM Records. He forms a group that records three albums with only one personnel change. And this is really his, like, meat and potato stuff. This is fantastic. Uh, first meeting, this one is called, this is the first by his quartet that he had. All of them had John Christensen on drums. My favorite drummer in the world. You know I'm going to say that every time I talk about John Christensen. Um, John Sermon on saxophones, which is just fantastic that John was even available to do this. Um, and Kenny Kirkland on acoustic piano. Not only is this, and, and Miroslav, only on upright bass. Not only is this, you know, the cream of the crop of his writing, but the recorded sound is fantastic. The band is fantastic. The piano sounds beautiful. Kenny Kirkland was playing beautifully. I think this is my favorite stuff. He, he played with, um, I think, Branford Marsalis. I don't know if he played with Winton or not. Um, but for me, there's more, uh, I guess, freedom in terms of how he played on here. And certainly more lyrical. His most lyrical playing, I think, is on the two albums he recorded a, a, as a member of this group. Really, be really beautiful. Highly, 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 highly recommended album. This is one of those, if you're going to pick up something by Merce La Vitas, that's one of the ones that goes to the top of the list. And uh, less than a year later, in sometime in 1980, oh, July 1980, uh, this next ECM album by the group, just just called the Miroslav Vitas Group, no no name. Um, July 1980, same band, same band. Miroslav an upright bass, no electric. Um, John Sermon again on the saxophones, clarinet. Kenny Kirkland playing beautifully on piano. John Christensen again on drums. Um, another highly 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 recommended uh, album. This this just this took forever to come out. Um, on CD, and it just came out in the last, I want to say, year, or so, probably in the last year, and I had burned my this copy onto a CD and dumped it in my computer because it seemed like it was never going to come out, but it did, and when they put it out, uh, they did it on, on a nice little digipack. There's not really nothing inside, but um, they did it on a nice little digipack, which I like. Fantastic album. Fantastic album. July 1982, a little, little gap there. And the, the third and last album by his group, his quartet, again on ECM. This is another fantastic one. Man, if you have anything by Miroslav, you have to have this one. This one is so pretty. Um, Kenny Kirkland was not on this album. Um, he was still alive at this point. But I think he was, like I said, I think it was Branford. I think he was a permanent member of his band at that point. Or doing other things, whatever. Um, couldn't make it. Which initially would have been a loss except he got John Taylor from Azimuth on piano on this album. So, I mean, it, it, it's like replacing somebody great with somebody great, you know. Um, John Taylor plays beautifully on this album. You might not even recognize that there's a difference in the piano playing because John Taylor obviously understood, probably heard the first two albums or understood 
what that musical vibe was, but really, that's the way John Taylor plays anyway. Um, and maybe it's just that his style fit in so well already. Because, you know, the piano chair in a quartet like this is a big deal. They cover a lot of the sonic bass of the, of the sound. John Sermon again on horns. John Christensen, my favorite drummer in the world, on drums. And Miroslav only on upright bass again. This is uh, July 82. This is unfortunately the last uh, Miroslav Vitas group album. But, oh, this is beautiful. This is another one I say. you got to get this. If you have any of his stuff, you got to get that. Oh, man, my stack is getting so big here. Um... Going slightly out of order, because I just forgot this, here's what he did in 81, or one of the things he did in 81, because I missed this, is the second time he got together, and the only other time that he got together with um, Terje Reptil and Jack DeJanet. Follow-up album called To Be Continued. So this was three years after the first album. This was such a disappointment to me, um, because any number of reasons... Only the first track written by Terry Reptile sounds anything like the first album. Where that first that first album was just so cohesive, as I said, that it's almost like the six pieces could have been one piece altogether on this album. Um, here, it sounds. I got I got to be honest with you. The first, as great as the first track is, and there's a, a couple nice moments in there. Um, there's only the only. This is odd because the very first album that they recorded together was very heavy on electric piano, but very processed electric piano and some like synthesizers in there and guitar synthesizer. So there's quite a lot of an electric keyboard sound on there. On this one, the only keyboard listed here is some acoustic piano, which only appears on two tracks. Now, on the first track, I definitely hear some background synthesizer creating this kind of wash. That is totally uncredited here, but listening to the technology that was available then couldn't have been. It wouldn't have been done on guitar. They didn't have the technology to kind of do that kind of wash sound in '81 anyway. Um, so I don't know why whatever that synthesizer part is didn't get credited. But I've listened to this for many years, and um, I, I can't believe that that there's no electric keyboards on there on that, on that first track called Maya. But um, Terry is only credited with electric guitars and flute. He was credited on the earlier album playing guitar synthesizer, too, and that would have been an early, early, early guitar synthesizer. But on other Terry J. Reptile albums from that time, um, with maybe one exception, I don't see guitar synthesizer being credited. So I, I know there was a lot of problems with those early guitar synthesizers. It didn't work out. Um, and I think a lot of people dropped them. And because they were not very prevalent uh, on being listed anyway in other Terry Reptile albums, I think it was basically like oh, the technology didn't work. So I don't know how much of the sounds in that earlier album actually came from a guitar synthesizer. But here it's not even credited. And I have to be honest, what the first track is really good. There's, a, there's a, another version of Mountain in the Clouds, which goes all the way back, something that... Miroslav Vitas recorded over his entire career many times. Um, goes back to his first solo album, the Mountain in the Clouds album, which was reissued as Infinite Search. So there's another version of that. Uh, a nice track called Morning Lake, which is the only thing that has any real prominent um, acoustic piano in it. It's nice, but then there's this rock thing called To Be Continued, which is just a jam session. It's credited to Jack DeJanet, but I think it's there's this one little guitar riff, which um, I think is played twice in the song, and it's like a five-second riff or something like that. Maybe that riff was written by Jack DeJanet, which is why he got credit, um, but it's basically a drum beat, and unfortunately, Miroslav plays electric bass on that track. It's the first time I ever heard him play electric bass because I hadn't, some of those earlier albums that he played it on, I hadn't bought yet. Um, not very good. He's playing it in a kind of, in a, in a groove, partially in a groove thing. It doesn't, it doesn't work. To, I don't want to hear Jack Deason play rock. I, these guys are too good, you know. Um, but it's almost like nine minutes of them just jamming, and, and Terje's basically making a lot of noise. He doesn't sound inspired playing. Um, you can tell his made up on the spot, but it wasn't a particularly inspired day. And there's a couple tracks on here 
that are just Jack and Miroslav Vitas. Miroslav Vitas uh, does some overdub bass, and he plays a couple parts. He'll play the bass line with Jack playing drums along, and then plays like kind of a lead line over it, or melody, or whatever, or solo, using the bow on the upright bass. Terrence is nowhere to be seen. There's another track on here called This Morning, which, again, to me, it has no guitar on it. It has Terrence playing flute. But it sounds to me like Jack DeJeanette and Miroslav went into the studio, recorded this improvisation, and Terrence Ripple came in later and threw some flute on top of it because there's no interaction really with the flute and the other two instruments. And I definitely got the vibe off this. Like, this was something that... Um, at the time that these guys agreed to get together to record an album, everybody signed off and said, yeah, you know, we'll get together in the studio in January 1981 and we'll, you know, record another album and work on till end. But it sounds to me like Terji was either preoccupied with something else or had a busy schedule and was off doing other things because it sounds like he wasn't in the studio for probably half of this album. Um, and there's not a lot of preparation with nine. It's a short album. It's 39 minutes long. Over nine minutes of it is that rock jam, which was... Beside that one little riff that, that shows up a couple times, um, most definitely is an improvisation. Um, the This Morning thing, that thing with the flute on, that's an improvisation um, also. And there's there's only a couple, you know, there, there's four tracks that are essentially written out, but on one of them, Terji doesn't even play on at all, which is the, the Mountain in the Clouds, which is an old Miroslav Vitas thing, which is just Jack. And um, Miroslav, and no Terje Ripto. So I think Terje had something going on. He was busy, he had concerts to do, or something else. But this is not. Uh, and people, I have. It's incredible to me that I've seen people say that they prefer this album over the first one. Are you kidding me? You know? <laughs> it's really bad. I still bought the CD. Um, now, I, of course, because remember that rule that I said? I forgot to pull something off the shelf? I did. I want to say in the early 90s, um, there was a DVD of Terje Ripto once again getting together with Miroslav Vitas after many years, because 81 was the last time they got together, and I'm pretty sure it was 92, I want to say, that um, Miroslav and Terje Ripto got together in a trio. This time, I guess Jack wasn't available. Jack was very busy with, many, with multiple bands of his own. Uh, with Tree Lock Gertu, though. And if you're not going to have Jack DeJanet there, and you're not going to have John Christensen there, maybe as a replacement, I think Tree Lock Gertu would be the next guy I go to because he's such an interesting percussionist. And he uses a lot of colors because he plays percussion and he's not a kit drummer. He's got access to so many sounds. There's a fantastic DVD that I spent way too much money on. I bought, a, I think, a British import version of a concert and uh, I want to say it's only about 60 minutes so it looks like it was um, something that was edited down to be a television uh, a European television show it's about 58 minutes so it looked like it was something that was filmed to fill an hour slot on European TV somewhere uh, you know an edited concert of those three playing and they play you know, some of the material from um, from the second album anyway Really fantastic. There's a long solo section of Tree Lock Gertu playing, which is amazing solo stuff. I don't know. I don't know how he crouches the way he does, and he manages to play things with his feet and his hands. I, I don't know how that guy does it. I, I'm amazed, and and that's the best uh, the best visual I've ever seen of his actual playing, where you could see what he was playing and how. Um, so that's a great trio. Too bad they didn't go in the studio and record something. Terry, Terry, have to be honest, isn't great on that. Um, I think he was in, in a more rock phase at that point in the early 90s and even late 80s. And um, he's playing kind of noisy at times, but Miroslav Vitas on Upright is playing his butt off. Unfortunately, um, none of them double on keyboards or go to keyboards at any moment. So you kind of lose that studio thing that they have going on. I wish that trio would have gotten into the studio. Fat chance that they'll get to do that now, the way, um, especially with Trelock Gertu's career, the way it goes. Um, but that DVD that I bought many years later came out uh, in the U.S. I'm not sure if it's still in print. It probably is. It's a hell of a lot more reasonable than what I paid for it. But now you can actually get it so that it's formatted to play on you know, American um, NTSC TV 
system, whatever you want to call it. Um, I haven't bought the American version because I still have my British version, which plays fine. But it's an interesting concert. As a matter of fact, I uh, dubbed the audio, the audio over years ago uh, just to listen to the audio. So I have that the audio on my computer. Uh, but that's a really recommended thing if you like those guys. I chose Miroslav Vitas today because I didn't want to make an epic video. And look at what happened. Um, continuing with his career. <laughs> I might as well finish now, right? September 85. I'm um, still recording for ECM, Emergence, which I know some of you folks out there have. Solo bass. Interesting, but you have to be a fan of solo bass. Um, but it's nice. It's musical. I don't recall now that I think about it. I don't think there's overdubs on here, so it's pretty much pretty much a live acoustic bass thing. Um, if you're a fan of acoustic bass, it's not very avant-garde. It's not the kind of thing like um, Derek Bailey and Dave Holland did when they got together. It's it's nice. It's very well recorded, like ECM stuff is. And uh, it's, it's a good album. I'm sorry at this point to see, though, that the band didn't exist anymore. September 85, this was. I don't have everything by him. I, uh, you know, I definitely, I definitely skip, skip some albums over. This I listened to today because I thought this was... Um, I thought this was a Jan Garbic album, and I forgot that. Oh, this is a Miroslav Vitas album. I didn't buy that for the longest time. Why? Well, here's the here's the lineup. Let me let me get the date on this first. Uh, January 1991. Star comes out, and it's a Miroslav Vitas album essentially. Um, well, you know what? No, it says Jan Garbic. It's actually a band, I guess. Um, because it's credited to Jan Garbrick, Miroslav Vitas, and Pete Erskine on drums. And I think they all write material for the album. So, you know, uh, yeah, Garbrick, Garbrick only writes one tune, though. Um, and then there's, uh, I guess, an improvisation that's credited to all three, Garbrick, Vitas, and Erskine, Pete Erskine on drums. Miroslav Vitas writing four tracks. Uh, maybe that's why I consider it more his album. And Pete Erskine writing two, Garbrick one. And... Um, one group thing that's probably an improvisation. I, I didn't buy this because um, initially it took me a long time to, to get this because I thought I would know what I was going to hear and I thought what I was going to hear was you know the, the drum and the bass functioning as kind of a rhythm section or a loose rhythm section and uh, Garbrick screeching on it. See, as a player a lot of the times I'm not into Garbrick's style of playing. I like his writing, I like the bands he puts together, I like his musical vibe in the world that he exists in, but I don't like his playing and my impression was, oh, he's going to be playing all over this, especially without a harmonic instrument, there's no piano or anything in there. Um, and it wasn't until I heard sound clips of this that I said, oh man, that's nice. It's weird because there's um, three or four of the shorter tunes are up-tempo tunes. And the four longer tunes are very reflective things. The recording is fantastic, the quality. I'm going to end up showing this one and do a Jan Garbrick video too, I guess. And the up-tempo things, which are the things that I'm sitting waiting to hear Garbrick screech on, he doesn't screech, even though there's some fairly, fairly up-tempo things or mid-tempo things. And it's almost like the material had obviously been written in advance, but... Garbrick was more laid back that day or whatever and didn't feel like screeching. And the album is so good because of it. Even though it's not a full sound, you kind of know that going into it. If you only have a saxophone, a bass, and drums, it's not going to sound like a, a full quartet or, or something like that because it isn't. Um, but man, I've never, I don't know if I've heard Garbrick play so laid back for an entire album. It's only 42 minutes. But it's so pretty, so beautiful, so well recorded. And I guess I consider this slightly more of, you know, because it is credited to all three guys, slightly more of a Miroslav Vitas album because he wrote four of the eight tracks on there. Um, but man, it's, it's a really, really good album. Um, this is in the stack of, you know, when I do a, um, a Garbrick video, I would definitely put it in my recommended list because it, you know, it totally does away with the qualities of Garbrick's playing that I don't like. It's like, he, I don't know if he had a headache that day and didn't want to screech or what it was, but it works. Um, 
And about a year later, I want to say, I, hate, I wish they would just put the recording dates on the back of the booklet so I don't have to open it. February 92, so not long after, because that one was 91. Um, Miroslav does another album, this one most definitely credit to him, called Atmos. And this is another one that's really good. Jan Garbrick plays on this too. He doesn't play as much, it's just a, it's just a, a duo. Um, I should have given this one a listen because I'm, I'm fairly sure that Garbrick is not playing on every track here, but I could be wrong. Um, all compositions on here were written by Miroslav Vitas, except um, there's a two-part thing, which total is, is less than five minutes uh, for the two pieces that is credited to both of them that I guess is a um, an improvisation. Uh, but again, I should have listened to this one, I, I, and I didn't. But I remember this one being a pleasant surprise as well. This is essentially the same as the last thing, but no drums. So it's almost like a Miroslav solo bass album, but Garbrick is playing too. Uh, very, And I remember liking this very much, and I should have given this a spin. Um before I started yakking about it. Uh, one more. I don't have... Um, Miroslav, I guess, um, was recording recently again for a number of years for ECM. I thought he dropped off, but he and he did for a few years in between, but then he picked up again. In uh, November 2004-2005, obviously there's a lot of years between that, he recorded um, an album called Universal Syncopations 2. Prior to this, he did Universal Syncopations 1, which I don't have. I know John McLaughlin plays on that. I think Chick Corea plays on that, too. Um, haven't picked that one up yet. This one I heard sound clips of. That one was real successful. And I, in some ways, I want to say it's probably because people saw the Sidemen and because McLaughlin played on it, went for it, uh, more so to do with the music. Um, this one I don't think was as successful because it doesn't pick up with that same group. I don't even know why he bothered to call it Universal Syncopations 2. It's completely different. Um, it doesn't have any of those folks from the Universal Syncopations 1. It's got a bunch of people on um, Bob Mincer on saxophones. If you're into jazz, you probably know who he is. Somebody, um, Gary Campbell, who I'm not familiar with on saxophones. Bob Malik on saxophones, who I've heard of. Randy Brecker on trumpet. A bandonian player. Uh, a vocalist used in a limited fashion. Two different drummers including Adam Nussbaum is one of them. Um, but it doesn't sound like a big band recording. It's, a, it's more orchestral, actually, in nature. It's not... Universal Syncopations 1 was essentially a jazz band. Uh, it wasn't the same musicians playing on every track. Like, you know, one might have a, a quartet or a quintet. The other, you know, the next track might be a trio. But it was the, the same group of musicians that played on, on that, on Universal Syncopations 1. On 2, all the musicians are different. And this is, well, by the description, music for ensemble, orchestra, and choir, composed, archived, arranged, directed, and produced by Miroslav Vitas. It's, despite the fact it sounds like a big band, kind of with like three or four horn guys, you know, to trumpet, you know, three saxophone players, a trumpet, two drummers, it's not really a big band, it's more, it's more of an orchestral thing. It's really good, totally different than, than anything else he's done. Um... Really, really, really good album. Has no relation to Universal Syncopations 1, which is why, by the way, I think some people gave it a bad review because they just wanted more of Volume 1. I wish you would have called it something else because it has nothing to do with Universal Syncopations 1. This is really good. I, From what I've heard of Universal Syncopations 1, I prefer this much more. And it's more orchestral. It looks like a big band jazz thing, but it's not. That I can't recommend highly enough, and that's one of his more recent things, recorded 2004-2005. Uh, just to, to round off here, it's ridiculous the length of this, um, is um, Vic Juris and John Etheridge, who are two guitarists, um, what Miroslav Vitas is doing in some of his downtime. In uh, 1988, he recorded as the bass player with this. They have uh, two guitarists, bass and drums. Miroslav plays on about half the tracks on this. Interesting album. And um, another gig that Miroslav had in, another one i got to open the booklet to get the date on, 1983, looks like this was a live club date, Miroslav was the bassist for a um, piano, bass, and drums trio by Guy Tom McKinley, so Miroslav is the bassist on that, 83, so that's what he was doing, you know, 
a couple examples of things that he does in between his, his gigs as a leader. And um, really, Universal Syncopations too. Man, that's a great album. I, I think um, people people could could potentially really dig that if you're up for. Um, it's not avant garde, but it's it's more orchestral in approach. And um, I chose Miroslav as my subject matter today uh, because uh, I was hesitant to do Jan Garbrick because I knew Jan Garbrick would be an epic length thing. And now I've made this an epic length thing that you could barely fit on a CD. Now it's I've gone an hour and 15 minutes. So, guys, I'm sorry for going so long. Um, I really, really thought this would be a half hour. <laughs> Shoot me. Okay, I should give the rest of you a whole, like, at least a month off after this. But that's my Miroslav Vitas thing. I'm sure I'm going to find all the things I couldn't find now that I'm done with it. Um, thanks for watching. I appreciate um, all the comments and the views and everything, guys. Hope I didn't go too long for you. Uh, I won't do it again, I promise. Bye.